Okay. <clears throat> All right. Is this looking okay? Then I'll go ahead and I'm going to run this through a demonstration of how to use uh, static green functions uh, from Pilot. Uh, this is going to be a simple 2D example, but it would be similar for 3D. So, oh, let's see, am I going to do the 3D one? Oh, I'm going to generate greens functions in 3D, but I'm not actually going to use them for anything. So I can show them to you. So uh, what it covers is the, uh, how we actually generate the greens functions, um, how we um, generate output at a specified set of points. That means that you know we have impulses that occur, say, on a fault. And then on the ground surface, we can have uh, points that would represent, for instance, uh, GPS stations. And we can interpolate the solution to those points. So that's what PyLit does. It does that for you. You just give it the points that you want to use. And then we're going to uh, go through post-processing of HDF5 output using H5Pi and a very simple linear inversion, uh, inversion using NumPy. And then we're going to plot the inversion results using Matplotlib. So um, what we do for what we're calling Green's functions is where we compute the deformation due to unit uh, slip at a fault vertex and use it uh, in an inversion for fault slip. So in reality, a Green's function um, in Pilot, we have slip at vertices on the fault. So when you slip at a vertex, it's, it's not like a delta function. It's actually tapers out. Say if you have um, tetrahedral, linear tetrahedral mesh, it will taper out linearly to all of the surrounding vertices. So that's what a Green's function means to us. Um, and it's a um, similar concept, but it's not the same as a uniform slip over a patch. So with the kata, you have constant slip over, say, a rectangular uh, region. And then you have these abrupt uh, contrasts at the boundaries. So we don't have that with the finite element code. We have slip at vertices that then tapers out linearly away from the vertex. And so uh, what the benefit of doing this is that we can include, for instance, um, in many areas, we have really nice 3D um, velocity models, seismic velocity models, which gives us the elastic properties with really So it allows us to take those variations and properties into account. And you can get different inversion results when you're taking those properties into account. So uh, the examples I'll show, um, you should have both of them. Hopefully no missing files. Um, so the 2D examples are examples 2D Green's functions. And so for that problem, we'll start out, we'll make some fake data, um, which we will also generate with Pilot. And then, um, then we will generate our uh, Green's functions. So we'll generate uh, Green's functions at a specified set of points. And then finally, we'll do this incredibly simple uh, inversion to invert back for the fault slit that we created um, in the first step. That's in the, it's also in the pilot user manual. And then I'll show a quick one of how to uh, generate three-dimensional um, Green's functions. This is in our uh, 3D hex 8 directory. It's example number, um, it's step 21. And so all this does is just shows how to generate them. We're not actually going to do anything with them. <clears throat> and OK. Ah, OK. I am going to go through mesh generation for the uh, 2D example because it um, uses something that we haven't done yet which is called ID-less um, uh, method of operation for qubit, where you don't have to refer to um, object IDs. You can instead refer to them by their position. So this works OK if you have a mesh that you're not going to change any of the geometry, but that you're worried that future versions of qubit or trellis may not work with it then it, it works well for that. And we have found 
that different versions of Qubit and Trellis will give you, they will number things differently and it can mess up your, your files. So we'll generate our mesh, we'll compute our synthetic um, observations, we'll uh, then compute our greens functions, we'll invert for the fault slip, and then we'll just, we'll do a quick visualization of what the inversion results look like. So uh, the packages that you need, uh, NumPy is uh, an extremely useful package. It's got all sorts of linear algebra stuff, um, I don't know, a lot of different tools that you can use. Um, and uh, it's included with the pilot binary distributions, so you'll already have that. Uh, also, H5Py, which is how we access the HDF5 files, that's also uh, included in the pilot binary distribution. Then finally, uh, matplotlib, which is a um, 2D plotting package for Python. It's meant to look more or less like the uh, MATLAB plotting, uh, but we do not include it in the pilot uh, distribution. So if you don't already have it, you'll need to get that from uh, matplotlib.org. So we're just going to do uh, a very simple linear inversion where we have our Green's function matrix we're solving for the unknown fault slip. We have uh, a priori estimates of what this fault slip should be. And then we have our observed displacement uh, fields at the, um, at the surface. Uh, we have a penalty uh, matrix that we, um, we use this for our regularization of the problem. And then uh, our penalty parameter, which controls how much we're applying that. Okay, so our Green's function matrix gives the displacement component I due to uh, units um, of slip from component J. So we're just solving this simple linear system of equations. We augment it using our penalty matrix and our a priori uh, values for the fault slip. And then we just do a generalized inverse. And so our estimated um, displacements are equal to the generalized inverse times our observations, our augmented observations. And then the 3D example, uh, the files are in examples 3D hex 8. And we compute um, responses due to strike slip and reverse slip uh, separately. And um, we have several different uh, config files that control that, and I'll, I'll go through those. We, of course, always have pilotapp.config. And then we have a separate one, uh, greensfunctions.config, uh, which I'll talk about. But it's, um, you know how earlier we talked about you can refer to something by either problem or time dependent. It means the same thing. It does, it no longer means the same thing if you're doing greens functions because that's a separate type of problem. So I'll show you what that looks like. And then we have step21.config, which are parameters that are specific to that example. This is how you would run it, uh, pilot, and you have to switch the problem type. That's what you do down here, uh, problem equals pilot dot problems dot greens functions. And then, you, and that means it will automatically read the greens functions dot config file. And then we have uh, additional parameters in step 21 dot config. So I think that's it. So I will go first, uh, let's see, if you go to, let's see, let's go back to, uh, to this directory here. At the top level, there's a readme file. I was informed that my font was too small earlier. Is, is that one any, is, uh, does that need to be at the back? It's good? Yep. Okay, um, tell me if it's too small. So, um, anyway, so it's pretty well described in the README what, what we're trying to accomplish. We're going to generate a mesh. Uh, we're going to have spatially variable slip for our forward model. And then we're going to generate our greens functions and do the inversion. So, um, there are two of them here. There's a reverse sample and a strike slip example. I'm just going to go through the reverse slip example so I don't run out of time again. 
Um, and uh, yes, I think I will start very quick with the mesh generation. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, we'll set our directory. Uh, we're going to do reverse. And we'll open up a journal file. Uh, we'll do the geometry. Okay, and I tried to in increase the font size in here too. Hopefully, it's not looking up. Just make that a little bigger. Okay, so this one, it, it, the geometry is not complicated. It's just um, just a simple reverse vault in a box. So we're going to do um, the first thing we're doing is that we're um, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is uh, turning on ID less journaling. But um, yeah, so this is uh, something we haven't really tried much before, but we're hoping it's going to be robust enough to uh, to keep using. So what I'll do, I'll go ahead and just play that little initial part, which isn't going to do anything. Let's see. Okay, so. What you'll see here, this is, again, we're just making a box, and uh, we're moving it so, um, uh, by a particular amount. Uh, um, so, yeah, so we have our volume that we've created, then we move it. Now, the first thing you see, this ID list part, rather than saying surface number or surface five or whatever, Instead, we're saying surface at, and this is giving coordinates ordinal, ordinal one, uh, and then we give it a name. So this idealist um, uh, meshing relies on the fact that the geometry doesn't change. If you move that surface, it's not going to know where it is anymore. So that's, but the benefit of this is hopefully portability between different versions of Qubit. So we're going to go ahead and make our box. We're going to move it. And then we're going to name these surfaces. So we're going to name the front and back uh, surfaces of the mesh. And then between these, we're going to uh, create a mid surface. And the reason we're doing this is because uh, there are a lot of operations on volumes that are not available for surfaces. And so uh, we can do some stuff on the volume, but then just this mid surface and then get rid of the volume once we've done it, used it. It's just easier, like make a break and then uh, get the middle surface. So we, you can see here, we formed this box, but then now we have this uh, mid surface here, and that's actually what we're going to be using. So. If you're wondering how we got the journal command there, the surface at minus 10606. In the commented line that I used on qubit 14.1 that generated that other file. So yeah. Charles, try running that mid surface. Try going back and uh, this one. from the beginning and running all the way up to the volume and running the mid surface. I think there's, right. I think there's only two surfaces. I don't, I mean, I don't. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, you may uh, un uncomment that, Oops. or just or done it, or okay, yeah. I'll start over. Yep. Oh, oh, did I? Uh, I missed it. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so we'll start all over, and then what we'll do, so this was the original kind of, um, 
Brad used. And then when we turned on that ID list journaling, uh, Qubit translated this command um, to this uh, uh, command here. Well, okay, there was a little messing around with it, but so if I do that, uh, oh, I got the comment. I didn't mean to get the comment. Ah, uh, well, I'll just do copy and paste it. Yeah. So there. So that did the same thing. That that way is kind of more intuitive and easier, but possibly not as portable. Yeah. That's ah, what I wanted to point out. This yeah. translation part here. Yeah. And it'll save that in your that qubit O one or whatever journal file that it saves. Um It'll have a record of all of these things translated into the ID list. Okay, so now we've, we've already uh, got our mid surface. And so now I'm going to. But didn't I just delete them? I just delete them. So, yeah. Yeah, so. So that's our surface that we're actually interested in. I don't know. It's a magic qubit thing. We, we don't <laughs> <laughs> we're not quite positive about that. We just, what was it, yesterday we were messing with this? Or Saturday, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is a new thing. Um, Anyway, so uh, we're going to just make the uh, fault surface, split it at a per particular location. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. So we just made a, we just split our surface along this along this line here. Um, and so then we're going to name the, the parts of it. Oh, and we're going to split it again. Okay, so now there's one that's fault extended. Fault extended at A. So yeah, we've split our. Okay. Um, okay, and now what we're going to do is just name uh, different parts here, and then we're going to, oh, I see, we did do that. Yeah, okay, we're still giving them names. Yeah, so we're just naming all of our curves. So, you can see now we have all these, we've named all the different, um, all the different curves in our mesh. And we're going to name a few key vertices that we'll want to deal with later for meshing. And there we go. So you can look and see what you are named. Yep, these are named. Okay, I am going to try and race through the uh, this part because I don't know if there's. Uh, so if I open up, uh, there's the gradient part. Um, so we've done the geometry. Um, we're going to do a triangular mesh, and then we put all the part that does all of our biasing, we put that in a separate file called gradient.journal. So we can look at that. Uh, 
Let's see, what is that the next thing we would do? No, first what we have to do, we'll do this part. We'll set our scheme. Then we'll look at our um, gradient file very quickly. And what you're going to see, we, we defined a, a function up here that we use uh, several places down here to define our uh, <coughs> sizes at endpoints. And then further down, using those sizes, we uh, use the bias sizing function that we saw earlier. Um, I don't think I want to go through this too much because I think it would take a while. But um, it's essentially just determining size from, from a, simple, uh, a simple function and then applying the same bias uh, sizing function that we used earlier this morning. So I'm going to, this part is just going to define a bunch of apropos um, variables. Okay, and then then we're going going to actual actually set this as on here using the uh, bias function. So there we go. Um, I'll get to the end and we'll preview what our sizing functions look like. Okay. Okay, so if we just want to do so that just shows what we've kind of set. So we have higher resolution here along the part of the fault that we're going to slip, and also along the um, ground surface in the area where we're probably going to have our observations, and then coarser out towards the edges. We'll get back to this. So we've already done that. Now we'll just mesh the surface. Okay, there we go. So and all. And uh, we can. We'll just give it one quick whack of smoothing here. Okay, um, and then the final thing, and I'm, I don't think I'll even go through this separately, is we're just defining all of the node sets that we're going to use. So that's our external boundaries, our ground surface, and our fault. We'll define all of those node sets. We can look at what we end up with once I've run it. So. <clears throat> okay. So if we look at our node sets, we have our fault. That's just the part that slips. We have our fault, which we'll need. Um, our x positive side, x negative side, y positive, and y negative. So, and then also we have our, which I didn't talk about. We, it's just a single material. It's all just um, homogeneous elastic. So then the final thing is to just export it. Okay, so we mesh. Now um, <coughs> we go back to our readme. So we've done this mesh generation part. Um, and then now the next 